On a le grand plaisir aujourd'hui de recevoir David Graeber, qui est professeur à la London School of Economics, et David Wengrow, qui est professeur à University College à Londres. David Graeber est anthropologue et on profite de sa la conférence qu'il va donner ce soir au Collège de France. J'ai réussi à le kidnapper pour ce séminaire ce matin. Et ils travaillent l'un et l'autre ensemble depuis quelques années sur des questions qui concernent directement la thématique de ce séminaire, à savoir les, la logique des, de l'évolution sociale dans des sociétés prémodernes. Et en l'occurrence, ils travaillent depuis pas mal d'années sur la question... Euh, des sociétés de la, disons, de la côte pacifique, euh, depuis euh, la Californie jusqu'au nord, c'est-à-dire jusqu'à la Colombie-Britannique, et euh, en particulier pour des questions qui concernent des formes de domination, d'inégalité, de, euh, dans des sociétés qui sont soit des chasseurs-cueilleurs, soit des chasseurs-cueilleurs en transition, et donc, euh, ils vont nous euh, présenter euh, ce matin dans un dialogue euh, sur euh, le travail qu'ils mènent en commun euh, sur cette euh, question. Euh, ça va être très différent de la conférence que David Graeber va donner ce soir, qui va porter sur les « bullshit jobs », les, 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 les boulots foireux. Euh, et, euh, et bon, voilà. Donc, je... aujourd'hui, c'est plus technique, disons, ce matin, c'est plus technique. Et euh, on est... Très heureux de vous avoir tous les deux. Thank you for coming. Uh, they are going to speak in English and, uh, for about an hour, and then we'll have a, start a general discussion. Merci. So how do we start? It could be b b bullshit jobs among foragers. Uh, I thought yeah. alternative title. <laughs> uh, do you want me to start? Um, yes. All right. But I'll take over very soon. It's with some <laughs> trepidation that we talk on this topic because um, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's a piece of research that we, we want to talk about, which sort of happened by accident in that we got drawn into this extraordinary uh, ethnographic and historical and uh, archaeological literature on the foraging, foraging peoples of the west coast of North America and Canada, um, more or less by accident. And neither of us are um, in specialists any, yeah, in, in any, any way, sense of the uh, term. In uh, California or the <laughs> northwest coast. Uh, but we just found the whole thing so fascinating. And some of the questions uh, that seem to have never been asked about these groups of people uh, that we spent a good part of uh, well One over year, a year yeah. Yeah. Um, just sort of plowing our way through the amazing uh, archives which are now so easily available uh, online. Uh, all the work by Kroeber students and so on and so forth. Yeah. There's a vast, vast literature um, which is available on archive.org, downloadable and searchable. Uh, so we thought to make take advantage of it. I, I should put in a larger context that we've been working on a project for some years, uh, which is essentially rewriting the narrative of uh, sort of the Rousseauian narrative that seems to continually reappear over and over again, no matter how much people try to overcome it. Um, And we thought maybe we can definitively put the stake in the heart of this particular thing by gathering together the results of, of current research, which largely has not been dis put before the public, I mean, even the scholarly public. We find that people increasingly not only write for only people within their field, but write only for people within their subfields, mm. um, so that when people even fairly erudite scholars are forced to fall back on the story of you know, what happened over the last 40,000 years, mm. uh, they end up telling a story that just clearly isn't true and has almost nothing to do with the picture that would be put together if you, if you took mm. together the evidence. So we've been working on various aspects of this. Um, you know, for example, the fact that hunter-gatherers don't actually normally live in, in tiny bands. I mean, almost anyone who uh, will automatically assume that for most of human history, humans lived in small bands of hunter-gatherers. Um, in fact, 
we wrote a piece earlier um, specifically in the results of that research, going back to Moses' book, Seasonal Variations of the Eskimo, uh, and the process of seasonality, how people have different social structures uh, during different times of year, would do a lot to explain a lot of the evidence that we have from the Paleolithic, which people are completely puzzled by, because there are signs that look like signs of extreme hierarchy going back 30, 40,000 years, but they're all in isolation and never develop into anything. It makes perfect yeah. sense if you imagine there's a seasonal process whereby you create these kind of mock hierarchies in certain types of year and then disassemble them in others. And then we got onto this when we got up to the stage where we were taking on the origins of agriculture. Of course, in the Rousseauian narrative, um, you have the happy uh, people in the state of nature, and then, of course, the original sin is, is agriculture. You start demarcating property. Mm -hmm. This eventually leads to the rise of cities, and then you get civilization as, was assumed to come as a package. You, know? you get the cities, you get the state, you get exploitation, war, but you also get uh, um, writing and high culture. And it's all sort of assumed as a take it or leave it single package. Um, another thing which we won't be talking about today is, is just how much that narrative is just utterly wrong. Um, mm. Almost all evidence we have show that early cities could have numerous forms of organization, many of which were quite robustly egalitarian. Mm. Um, so, but this particular project came out of trying to understand the origins of agriculture, even though we're talking about people yes. who did not have agriculture. Well, I mean, the point <laughs> is that we're not into the business of drawing analogies here between the ethnographic record and the archaeological uh, record. Um, but we are struck, uh, were really struck, when it came to uh, thinking about the origins of uh, agriculture. Uh, at just how much the ethnographic record is still being pressed into service uh, as a sort of surrogate or replacement for archaeological evidence, which is how we found ourselves drawn in mm -hmm. to this literature, because the peoples, the Aboriginal peoples of the West Coast of North America, uh, more than any other, uh, seem to have become uh, emblematic uh, of a kind of... Um, evolutionism and a sort of sociological reductionism, which would have them all categorized as roughly the same thing. Call it uh, complex hunter-gatherers or storing hunter-gatherers or affluent hunter-gatherers. Um, whereas in fact, what struck us immediately on reading a bit more deeply into this literature uh, were the contrasts between the two major culture areas as classically defined uh, as California, uh, which is on your map. Um, and the Northwest Coast. And the Northwest Coast, which originally were defined as food areas by Clark uh, Whistler. Um, food being a crucial uh, sort of uh, vector of differentiation between these two macro areas. And then people have spent many decades unpicking this sort of gross classification. Um, but the area that we became particularly fascinated by is the one at the top of the map on what I suppose is the modern boundary between California and Oregon. Yeah, it's, it's um, in Oregon and Washington. Which is where these... So this is the, the map from Kroeber's uh, original handbook. Um, and um, you can see what happens up at the top there. You get this kind of accordion-like compression of ethnic and linguistic uh, groups. Uh, it's a sort of uh, shatter zone. Um, which has resisted classification mm. uh, over the years um, of any sort, uh, really. Yes, you have people with rather similar cultural practices speaking utterly unrelated languages, living in close proximity, and others speaking yeah. the same languages with incredibly different um, cultural practices, cosmological assumptions. Now, what really set us going on this, I think, if I remember correctly, uh, David was... Um, finding this essay published oh, yes. in, I think, 1951, with a very strange title, and I'm actually going to consult our bibliography. It just shows you what a bad <laughs> title can do for a great piece of analysis. Hey, is this? this is Walter Goldschmidt. Oh. In Walter Goldschmidt, uh, who worked closely with Kerber, in 1951, in American Anthropologist, published a piece called... 
ethics and the structure of society, an ethnological contribution to the sociology of knowledge, which tells eminently you... Eminently forgettable, yeah. Eminently forgettable. <laughs> it tells you almost nothing about what it's about. Uh, but it's about California. And um, it... Uh, yes, it, as a result, no one has read this article. Nobody's read this article. I mean, it's yeah. got remarkably few citations, partly probably because it's also about ethical and moral systems among hunter-gatherers at exactly the time when everybody else was getting interested in ecology and uh, looking more at groups like the Hadza and so on. Um, so it's one of those pieces that's fallen... Uh, between the posts. But the argument he makes there is quite extraordinary, and it's about California, and particularly these groups like the Yurok uh, and the uh, Wintu and the Maidu and the Talawa, who are all compressed oh, yeah. Yeah. into that uh, northwestern section of California. It's sort of unfortunate that it's the northwest because you then have to differentiate it from the northwest coast, yeah. which is the macro culture area directly to the north. So we're talking about the... We'll call uh, it the Shatter Zone. The Shatter Zone. We will yeah. call it the Shatter Zone. And uh, what he points out there, point by point, um, is that the people living there in the 19th and early 20th century, as documented ethnographically, uh, although they were all foragers, and actually should emphasize that all of the groups we're talking about uh, today uh, did not practice uh, farming. There's a, there's a trend uh, these days to write about them uh, as if they were farmers and to point out that they did a great deal of landscape management and landscape alteration. But at the same time, these are precisely the groups that resisted the tropical uh, crops, maize, beans, and Perfectly squash. Perfectly clear they knew about them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> which makes it even more extraordinary that they're often held up as exemplars of what human societies might have been like before the origins of farming. Uh, in a sense, they're the last people on earth uh, you should probably look at. Um, so uh, it's a strange sort of evolutionism. Anyway, what Goldschmidt, Goldschmidt points out point by point is that these particular foragers exhibit almost every single aspect of Max Weber's Protestant ethic um, in the absence, obviously, of industrialization, mm -hmm. wage labor, uh, and the principle of monetary interest. <laughs> they have money. It's shell money, uh, dentalia. Mm. Um, but what Goldschmidt points out is that they also have this um, moral uh, obligation to work hard and conspicuously be seen to mm -hmm. work hard, uh, to make money but not show it off, in other words, uh, you know, don't eat too much and uh, don't, uh, don't show off your wealth. Um, Just make sure everyone knows you have it. <laughs> make sure everyone knows you have it. And um, really this sort of principle of, uh, of abstinence, um, which is, uh, for example, uh, typified in their uh, sweat house, rituals where in order to enter the sweat house you have to squirm through this small aperture so if you're overweight uh, you can't even get inside uh, to have the sauna um, so uh, he points out you know it's really a very very thorough sort of systematic analysis um, which I mean ought to have had major historical implications I mean if you can show that there are foragers uh, who have developed a moral, ethical system extraordinarily similar to that of late medieval, early modern Europe uh, before the uh, explosion of capitalism, uh, you'd have thought that has sort of implications comparatively. Yeah. Mm. Uh, but it's been completely ignored. Um, and the thing that struck us most about it was that, uh, I mean, the other great essay on this region, which was uh, out of keeping with the fashion uh, and the trend towards ecology was, of course, uh, levi Strauss's discussion, famous discussion of uh, house societies uh, on the northwest coast, where he's effectively talking about the neighbors of these Protestant uh, foragers, uh, who, of course, turn out to be rather feudal uh, uh, nobility who keep hereditary slaves uh, and as far as anybody can remember, have a long history of raiding one another uh, for people. They're, they're proper capturing societies, as uh, uh, Santos Granero 
mm. put it in, in the book he wrote uh, a few years ago. And, so, and this is very important to emphasize because this has sort of been written out of the Northwest Coast. That mm. something like, was it 20% of the population appears to have been slaves? Um, yeah. So even though no, you, know, you have aristocrats, commoners, and slaves, and aristocrats don't really have any way to boss commoners around uh, to give them orders. But um, so it's often said, well, you know, they're not really aristocrats except in a very distant sense of the term. But that's completely ignoring the existence of slaves in, in the pre-colonial period. That's right, and um, who are often killed at potlatches. Or something. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, and and, uh, and and of course the potlatch as, as an institution, um, you know, is, is almost diametrically opposed to the kind of values that Goldschmidt is writing about in relation to this northwestern part of uh, California. So I think we sort of assumed that somebody mm -hmm. over the last hundred years must have asked the question, what happened when these people ran into each other? I mean, there's no physical border. These are all reasonably decentralized groups of foragers uh, distributed along the Pacific uh, littoral. There is an archaeological record which shows that you have continuous trade and interaction by canoe up and down the coast going back thousands of years. The Dentelia shoals that the Californians are using as, yes, as money and, come uh, from the north. Uh, obsidian and various other things. Um, and yet, uh, remarkably, and we really did read very hard on this topic, nobody seems to have addressed the question of how you end up with two apparently such different uh, sort of uh, societies living on one another's doorstep. The closest we got was that amazing little book by uh, the World Systems guy. Oh yes, um, the win to a very small world system. Very uh, small world system. Chase Dunn and Hall, yeah. Uh, from the <laughs> 1980s, 90s? Oh, later than that, yeah. It's fairly recent, maybe even 90s. Fairly yeah. recent. Mm -hmm. And what he points out is that actually the groups here in this part of uh, Northwestern mm -hmm. California, uh, at least some of them uh, do speak uh, Athabascan uh, languages and were clearly migrants from the Northwest coast uh, down into the area uh, of uh, modern day uh, California. Uh, and in the process of moving, seem to have lost, as he puts it, uh, some of these hierarchical uh, practices and mm. institutions. Um, the argument that we ended up with, and that we will try to, I should say, we, we've just realized that we've never actually talked to anybody except each other uh, about this particular piece of research. So apologies in advance if it's a little bit all over the place. But the argument we ended up with was that they didn't lose these institutions uh, at all. They co quite consciously rejected them. And this um, comes, I should probably say, to frame this as uh, an ongoing concern and, and a theme that's developed in a lot of our research about schismogenetic processes in a sort of Batesonian sense, so that it seems that in many parts of the world you can observe that people are defining themselves against each other. Um, I mean, you could take Jim Scott's stuff on Zomia as, as, as a kind of one example of this, but it's a relatively simplistic example. Um, and uh, David had really impressed me, in fact, one of the... Um, first ways that, that his work really kind of blew me away was I was reading um, an essay he wrote. I'll talk about your essay. Um, about right. metal. Um, uh, why is it that you find these potlatch-like deposits of, of metal in the Bronze Age, which are you know, clearly being thrown away and, or destroyed in some extravagant way? It, it seems sort of very much like uh, representations of potlatch or competitive feasting. Something's going on where there, people are just destroying objects which are obviously objects of, of, of luxury and wealth. And, but it always, it's never, it's at the same time as the rise of, of commercial and bureaucratic city-states, but it's always on the fringes, the guys who are supplying them with raw material. Um, and it would seem that you know, there is a process whereby the people in the cities are, are defining themselves against the barbarians in the hills, but also vice versa. You know, the potlatches and these other or efflorescence of competitive feasting that we often observe ethnographically often happens at the moment when such societies are being incorporated in a larger commercial bureaucratic or 
order, in this case the modern world system, which been, within a generation or two almost invariably eats them up, conquers them, uh, and, and shuts such things down. But here we have a place where the same thing was happening, but the balance of forces was very, very different. It was about equal. So these people remained in this kind of equilibrium where the people in the cities were being less, tried to be less and less like the barbarians, and the barbarians less and less like the people in the city, sometimes for thousands of years. Um, mm only for centuries, but the very interesting thing is the people who seem to be throwing away all these vast quantities of metal are precisely the people who later appear in the heroic epics, so whether uh, the Vedas or the um, Homeric epics, uh, um, you know, who are defined exactly by this kind of competitive feasting, vast displays, sort of proto-politicians vying with each other um, to attract followers by great acts of heroism and mm -hmm. boasting and dueling and uh, sacrificing. But at the same time, um, a rejection of writing. You know, that's, that's why you have the epics to begin with. Um, so, so there is a schismogenic process going on between them. And when you start looking for this stuff, it's everywhere. Um, you yeah, would, so this I mean, is what we, our first instinct, something like this is clearly going on. These people seem diametrically opposed. And we return to Moses' idea of civilization as a sort of creative refusal. People yeah. simply refusing the, uh, and rejecting each other's customs as a way of defining themselves. Right. Something and like that is happening, but how? We don't have any <laughs> obvious physical uh, or organized physical resistance in place. In other words, there's no great standing army of foragers, you know, lined <laughs> up on the border of Oregon saying no more slavery. <laughs> there's something else going on, and it presumably is happening more from the bottom up. Um, yeah. And um, that's right. Mm. And then, I mean, where our thinking sort of led us after that, I'm just trying to re retrace our steps. I hope you don't mind that I summarized your article. You can summarize. No, that's fine. fine because it's three different lectures. <laughs> um, It'll work. So we had these two sorts of um, uh, totemic articles uh, next to each other. We have Levi Strauss with his um, sort of nobles on the northwest coast, and we have Goldschmidt with his Protestant foragers <laughs> next door. And we wanted to try and understand something more about the, um, the relationship between these two things. And so um, I, for one, scoured the ethnographic record, yeah. trying to find some reference somewhere to what people in California thought of people to the north or vice versa. I mean, are there any references? I mean, they were trading. Um, there were objects coming back and forth from the, uh, between the places. So is there, and, and I couldn't find very much. I was looking for myths about um, things like that. But we, I managed to find one story. Um, which was preserved entirely by accident in a, in a journal in 1870. I have it here. But oh, before we it? come on to it, oh. I've remembered now. Ah. We went through a long period of frustration <laughs> and eventually came to the conclusion that we had run into a wall of prejudice. Prejudice about foragers. Mm, um, prejudice about foragers to the extent that even where you have two such diametrically opposed systems, you know, let's call them for simplicity's sake, feudalism, it's not feudalism, it doesn't matter, but feudalism and, uh, you know, some form of early capitalism, uh, which it isn't either. But let's just say hypothetically that you had two such clearly diametrically opposed uh, uh, systems next to each other. In any group of societies, nobody would ever dream of lumping them into a single category. I mean, it would be the equivalent of taking the last thousand years of European history and just calling all of them complex farmers on the basis that they grew wheat. Um, nobody would ever dream of doing this, except with foragers. Where it's okay, um, they're all the same. Where, much. you know, you can, you can take, and, you know, the, the, I think the, the most extreme example of this kind of reductionism uh, that I found was the book by Brian Hayden, about feasting societies, oh, yeah. <laughs> which has Californians and Northwest Coast all lumped in together as a single category um, on the basis that they feast and are feasting foragers who might have been the kind of people who invented farming had they not been exactly the kind of people who in fact resisted farming. <laughs> I mean, it's a very convoluted sort of argument. Um, 
And um, that's how we sort of got started, I think, was mm. actually, you know, if you look at their feasting, I mean, of course, everybody feasts in some way or another, but <laughs> if you actually look at their feasting practices, the, they the couldn't ones, be more different, they couldn't yeah. be more different, yeah. at least as described <laughs> ethnographically. Now, you know, quick caveat, because we, so we wrote this up and submitted it uh, in a moment of hubris to American <laughs> anthropologists, uh, which resulted in the most extraordinary review process. So I've never had quite such extensive and uh, detailed, detailed and, uh, sort of yes, 18 they pages. They said people who actually knew something about the yes. Northwest Coast. And, so and we had a very detailed response from a behavioral uh, ecologist and another one from an archaeologist and another one from a cultural uh, They were actually mostly positive. For that. They all saw mm -hmm. some merit mm -hmm. in what we're doing, but they were also critical. The funny thing was that the criticisms on grounds of racism, colonialism, stereotyping, and ethnocentrism came largely from the archaeologists, whereas the cultural anthropologist who actually works with descendants of these groups said, yes, at last, you know, somebody's, somebody's actually writing their history. So all we can yeah. conclude from this is that nobody talks to each other in North America, mm. uh, although they're in the same departments. Um, but I'm getting off topic. Feasting, right. So, I mean, if you Foragers are all the same, and white, yeah. Fires are all the same, except they're not. So if you look at the actual descriptions of ceremonial feasting in uh, this part of California, which takes the form of things like deerskin dances and these periodic uh, trade fairs, um, it's almost like a uh, potlatch in reverse in the sense that um, you don't uh, compete with luxury foods. Uh, it's mostly about staple foods and sharing them. Yeah, it's incredibly uh, bland, repetitive acorn stuff. Lots of acorn <laughs> porridges and such <laughs> like. Um, there's none acorn of this seed. Uh, seed. ranked seating <laughs> order that you get in the potlatch mm. where the classifications and ranks are clearly laid out, actually what and seems to And indeed there happen, are no classifications and ranks. Yeah. No, but even the ones that exist are sort of playfully transgressed in the Californian mm. uh, situation. And you actually get this uh, uh, very generous sharing of treasures and valuables, things like obsidian blades and uh, important animal skins, are actually passed over from one group to another mm. via a, uh, a dance leader, I think it is. Mm. And they sort of lovingly wrap and look after one another's valuables. Uh, obviously, the contrast here would be with the chopping up and smashing of right. metal crests right. and so on, uh, as classically. And the general aggression of giving away yeah, bad it's, things. And so, bad. you know, to describe these all as being the same thing in the way that, that Hayden's book does seems to do an incredible amount of violence uh, to the data. That's not. Um, to say that nobody gained anything by hosting these uh, feasts in the Californian situation. It's clear that there were uh, organizers and uh, big men who benefited monetarily from hosting them. Um, but actually, it was Napoleon uh, Chagnon, was I think, who pointed yeah. out uh, that uh, you know they do this. Um, he thought the Californian sort of feasting cycle was really more about buffering and leveling out resources. And California, topographically, um, is, uh, is another reason why archaeologists find California so fascinating, um, is because it resembles, I think, more closely than any other region on Earth, uh, the area around the Jordan Valley ah. and the Fertile Crescent, where farming actually was invented 10,000 years ago, in the sense you have this, this tight compression of different ecologies. You yeah. have the mountains, the foothills, the river valley, uh, the desert, and the coastlines all compressed together in a very tight framework. Uh, and yet, in the American situation, it's one of the very last places to adopt farming, which just shows you how pointless uh, environmental determinism uh, is. Yeah. Um, but uh, Chagnon's point was that, uh, you know, quite often these feasts are actually occasions for people from slightly different ecological niches to balance out deficits in the annual harvest uh, and so on and so forth. Anyway, um, it seemed to us there were some very obvious differences. And that's what set us off looking for differences. And what emboldened us to do this was this little oh, piece this little story, of yes. oral history. And, and, and it's the strangest thing because it was written by someone who was looking at these burials and trying and had a theory that there were Japanese immigrants um, in this area and some pro long ago time. Um, 
the, the reasons he brought it up are irrelevant. The, 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 what's interesting is it's the one story about a group that actually went from the Northwest Coast area to the, into California and what happened. Um, well, the story is with Chetko. Or, I've got it right here. Oh, you it's, want to read uh, it? Okay. it was, uh, you can read it. I know you like reading it. Really? It's Steve, it's, uh, it was published... <laughs> It was republished in pa sure. uh, Stephen Powell's uh, Tribes of California, which That's is it, yeah. 1877, based mm. on an account by a yeah. geographer called A.W. Chase, which is from 1873. Right. And he was the guy who was talking about the mountains. That's I, right. I found it. Mm. That's right. And it's, it's about a group who don't <laughs> exist uh, anymore uh, called the Chetco. Um, mm. And this is what he says. So in, when he was writing this in 1873, the Chetco had been decimated. Actually, this I think area, that there were like two families left. Yeah. And, this, yeah. this part of the Oregon coast apparently was one of the first to, uh, to fall prey to... Uh, Basically genocidal diseases. attacks by the settlers. Yeah. yeah I mean, they were uh, just massacred a lot of them. Yeah. Um, so we're talking about highly traumatized groups who were living on a reservation in Lincoln County when described uh, in this way. But they told this story to Chase. Um, and he says, The Chetcos say that many seasons ago, their ancestors came in canoes from the far north and landed at the river's mouth. They found two tribes in possession of that uh, territory. One, a warlike race resembling themselves. These they soon conquered and exterminated. The other was a diminutive people of an exceedingly mild disposition and white, as in white-skinned. Which is probably irrelevant, but yeah. <laughs> it will become relevant. Yeah. <laughs> and they called themselves, or were called by the newcomers, Wogies, or Wage. Uh, they were skillful in the manufacture of baskets, robes, and canoes, and had many methods of taking game and fish, which were unknown to the invaders. Refusing to fight, the Wogies were made slaves of and kept at work to provide food and shelter and articles of use for the more warlike race, who waxed very fat and lazy. <laughs> one night, however, one night after a great feast, the Wogies packed up and fled and were never more seen again. <laughs> however, later on, when the first white men appeared, the Chetkos supposed that they were the Wogies, returned. With even better technology. <laughs> yes, with guns, germs, and steel. But they soon found out their mistake, and yet retained among themselves the appellation for the white men, who are still known as Wogies by all the coastal tribes in the vicinity. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now. Yeah, so, so, so what's significant about the story is... Um, that it directly brings up the sort of value of thinness and fatness. Um, so you have these people from the north, they're very warlike. Um, they immediately show up and take lots of slaves. Um, but, but the very fact that they do so is their undoing. They become fatter and stupider, and the slaves like, go on being clever and, and well-organized until the point where they just run away and they're too fat to chase them. Um, but you know, it, it, it's sort of a simple encoding of a value uh, which you can see in very much um, in the opposition between these pot lodges, which is all basically celebrations of fat. They're pouring fat on the all, they're giving each other buckets of fat, they're eating all this fatty fish. Um, whereas the California thing where they're, they're, they're just like giving each other this soupy acorn gruel and <laughs> trying to fit through little holes. And, and, and if they're pot lodging anything, they're pot lodging work. Uh, so on the one hand, the Kwakutl have slaves who are mm. specifically seen as people who get water and, and drag wood um, because no, no person or even commoner would really do uh, that. Whereas in the Californians, their initiation rituals essentially involve dragging water and wood for days to build these steam baths. But and you're jumping ahead. Oh, am I? Yes. I didn't go on. These are the, <laughs> these are the points of schismogenesis yeah. that we ended up with. Oh, okay. But, <laughs> you go. but I've just yeah. remembered that um, we initially thought how <laughs> flippant it would be to try and rewrite the whole relationship between these groups on the basis of a single, uh, probably fictitious anecdote. 
from uh, one group. Happened or not. Yeah. We <laughs> ought to we <laughs> ought to consider other possibilities. And uh, oh. Oh, okay. the, the literature <laughs> which we found out there was written mostly from the perspective of human behavioral ecology. Okay, should we talk about this a bit? A little bit. A little bit. Hold off on the fat stuff. Particularly <laughs> because um, you know, some of the responses, that, I mean, the, the sort of official responses from the, the journal to our article <laughs> were by behavioral ecologists who. Um, felt that we were somehow opposed to what they were doing. But it was actually really quite to the contrary. Mm. Uh, Front-loaded and back-loaded. Yeah, we, that, we yeah. found one particularly <laughs> fascinating piece called Why Acorns Before Salmon, uh, which is mm -hmm. by uh, uh, Robert uh, Bettinger and Shannon T uh, Tushingham. Mm. Um, and uh, it, it sets about this whole... I mean, first of all, it's interesting because it does actually address some of the uh, contrasts that we're talking about between these two regions. Um, but it starts off with the observation that there is an ecological uh, puzzle about California, and particularly northwestern California, which is that, uh, like the northwest coast, this is an area which is very rich in aquatic resources uh, and anadromous fish, so salmon, and Yulacan and so on, which in terms of uh, traditional behavioral ecology are very uh, desirable foods for foragers. They're so-called high-ranking yeah. foods. You, uh, you, know, you catch a whole load of them in season uh, and you're set up for the winter ceremonials and the rest of the year. Um, and you can store them and process them as oils and fats and, and all these other uh, uh, consumables. Smoke them. Yeah. Whereas acorns, and nuts, uh, which for millennia, it turns out, have been the preferred staple uh, in much of California, are traditionally ranked, you know how behavioral ecologists rank things on a purely sort of utilitarian basis in terms of the amount of labor, down on the, food scale, yeah. the amount of labor required to exploit a food resource. So acorns are pretty low in the sense Despite that- Despite the fact that there's lots of salmon and other things like that around in California. That's right. I mean, so, they could live like Northwest Coast people had they wanted to. Yes. And in order to, to eat acorns regularly, you have to leach them and grind them. It's a labor-intensive thing. Why would any sensible forager put themselves through this misery when they could be... Uh, this, is the, this is the conundrum they start off with. And the explanation they come up with is that it's really all about predation and the risks of raiding in the sense that... Uh, so this is their explanation, not ours. But what they point out is quite a logical point, um, which is that uh, with uh, fish exploitation, uh, you have an enormous amount of uh, labor that goes into preparing for the first fish run, uh, building weirs, nets, dams, uh, traps, and so on. And then, of course, in order to convert all these fish into storable foods, you need to concentrate an extraordinary amount of labor directly after the fish harvest. And the labor that you put into it is, is front-loaded. It's, it's what they call front-loaded yeah. yeah, so, so you, yeah, you have to do it at first, and then you have something that's just good to go. Yeah. So you need enormous amounts of work. Oh, helps to have slaves. Um, or some some inten very intense labor force, um, which whereby you can process the food at first because it's fish; it's going to go bad. Mm -hmm. But once you've got it smoked and stored and dried or um, so forth, turned into oil, then it's ready to eat and it stays that way for a very long period of time. Yeah. Unlike acorns, which are exactly the opposite. I mean, there is the, the point of the whole thing is that there's not much point in stealing somebody's acorns. Because you can gather a lot of acorns, you've still got to do 90% of the work after you steal it. That's right. So what they argue is that this might explain certain other institutional features of the societies we're talking about in the sense that uh, societies which uh, rely very heavily on uh, uh, harvesting fish um, on a seasonal basis are kind of making a noose for their own necks in that they're creating this great stock of stored processed resources which are very tempting to raiders and thieves and that somehow this might explain some of the other institutional differences between the Northwest Coast and California. So we, we thought, you know, this, this was uh, important to think about, um, but also not 
quite satisfactory. As an, I mean, if it worked as an explanation, then we can just go home. I mean, it's, you know, there's no point in doing the sort of analysis we're doing, and the tale of the wogies can be consigned back to uh, nowhere, um, because you would have a nice, neat ecological explanation uh, for the kind of social differences. But there are problems with it. I mean, one of the obvious problems is that most of the raiding, which is documented on the northwest coast, actually doesn't seem to be for food. Uh, it seems no. to be for people. And the reason people raid for people... Um, is to process the food. Is to process the food. <laughs> it's, uh, it's not primarily an ecological thing. I mean, there's no shortage of labor as far as yes. we can gather up there. The point is that a great number of the people concerned are aristocrats who wouldn't be seen dead uh, doing most of this uh, work. It's not an actual shortage of hands uh, that you get on this seasonal basis. It's a shortage of controllable labor. Mm. Uh, and it's rather interesting in that respect that in the, uh, the uh, parable of the wogies, mm. uh, it's emphasized that they're very good at this sort of thing. They have uh, efficient techniques of mm. catching fish and making baskets mm. and so on. So what the Chetko or the proto-Chetko are actually capturing mm -hmm. uh, is uh, uh, you know, a, a lot of uh, invested knowledge and, and skill. Um, so that was one problem we found with the sort of neat uh, ecological uh, explanation. Um, another thing that occurred to us is that maybe it is a Jim Scott sort of situation, mm -hmm. where in the same way that there's no point in stealing uh, acorns, uh, there's not much point in stealing acorn eaters, uh, which is what the Hooper and other groups uh, call themselves. Yes. We are the acorn eaters, because what are you going to do with them? I mean, keeping slaves comes at a, a certain cost. Right. Uh, and if you can't speak the same language, I mean, you're going and to And they don't know how to do any of the things you want them to do. Yes. Um, but this is purely hypothetical. Mm. Effectively, what this set us off on is looking at that shatter zone in a lot more detail. Um, and actually wondering whether there was some other kind of explanation, um, which was much more to do with these kind of um, quite conscious uh, decisions mm. to create another sort of society by groups which had uh, been exposed to uh, but rejected um, the kind of societies described on the northwest coast. And once we started looking, uh, we were quite staggered. Uh, by the number of examples and instances where you can actually point to what seems like a, more or less a direct inversion in a very Gregory Bateson-like... Schismogenetic uh, fashion. Schismogenetic yeah. mm -hmm. sense. I counted them, and I think we oh, came yeah? up with seven major points of schismogenesis. Oh, that's right. Um, and this is what we will what finish on, right? I counted right. them. So you but, but we should point out that in this area there is other evidence of interaction. Uh, there was a yes. slave trade going on yes. Um, yes. quite early on where some of the, the Chinook, well, you know, the word potlatch is Chinook in jargon. It's a trade, uh, comes from a trade language. And Chinook and traders were going around. We only know what was happening in the period where horses show up. But the first thing they do is the Chinookans like ally with some people who've got horses and start spreading the idea of the potlatch, but also as an idea, a way of mobilizing people to grab slaves to trade up north. Um, That's right. We yeah. found that ethnography by Leslie Spear, which yes. uh, it shows very clearly that groups around the Klamath uh, River. This is in Oregon, uh, way top. Of yeah, so we're in that. Zone. Yeah, we're north of the Shatter Zone now. Uh, once they got horses, did actually start slaving and incorporating mm. certain aspects of potlatch. But what's interesting is that it's it's very clear that this was regarded as an anomaly. Um, yes. But then, and then other people were, were self-consciously resisting it. So these yeah. people were interacting with each other. The Wogi story isn't the only example of the two different ethos confronting each other directly. Um, and in fact, some of the ways that people organized war was quite self-consciously to make it impossible for um, a slave trading society or a slave society to develop. Oh, that's that's right. Uh, that was so, sch so, schismogenetic point yeah. number one, ah, yes. well, uh, which we extracted from, segue. from Kerber, <laughs> uh, is the legal point. Yes. The Yurok uh, actually had legal uh, systems in place mm -hmm. which required the winners in a fight to pay individual compensation for every life taken at the going rate for murder. Mm 
so uh, this obviously makes raiding fiscally uh, pointless and morally bankrupt. And uh, the way Kreber puts it, he says, the ve victis of civilization for the Euroch might well have been replaced at least in a monetary sense, by the dictum, woe to the victors. Um, so there is a legal uh, system in place against raiding. Then there are the sort of moral points that come through in the anecdote uh, about the wogies, which, you know, they seem to resonate with Goldschmidt's uh, analysis of these rather Protestant-like features. Mm. Uh, I mean, the reason that the wogies come out on top uh, it's like a cautionary tale. You know, this is what will happen to you if you try and enslave people and profit from their labor. It's the industriousness uh, of the, uh, yes. the wogies. That, you get uh, fat and you lose your industriousness. Yeah, they're so fat they can't even chase after them when they run away. Um, and this seems to have been a widely shared tale. And then there were the, the little details, the sort of schismogenetic details that come through in the description of rituals. So this business about chopping and carrying wood. Mm. I mean, there's the, the magisterial study of slavery on the northwest coast is by the historian Leland uh, Donald. Donald yes. And he puts together mm. a whole variety of ethno-historical sources which show that, you know, rather as in the with the Gibeonites in the Old Testament, uh, chopping wood Hewers and carrying... Hewers of wood and carriers of, of, water, of, wood and yeah. carriers of water. Uh, no self-respecting northwest coast uh, noble would be seen doing these things. So to chop and carry wood uh, was essentially to advertise your status as a slave. Mm. Um, and Donald has a variety of sources on this. Um, and then what struck us uh, reading Goldschmidt is that the Californian groups take this particular uh, form of labor and actually turn it into the focus uh, of a ritual. And I'll just read out briefly what Goldschmidt uh, says about initiation rites um, oh, yeah, sure. <clears throat> in that northern part of uh, California, because it's quite striking, I think. Um, All men, particularly the youths, were exhorted to gather wood for use in sweating. This was not exploitation of child labor, so this is all Goldschmidt, but an important religious act freighted with significance. Special wood was brought from the mountain ridges. It was used for an important purification ritual. The gathering itself was a religious act, for it was a means of acquiring luck. It had to be done with a proper psychological attitude of restrained demeanor and constant thinking about the acquisition of riches. The job became a moral end rather than a means to an end with both religious and economic uh, involvements. And then, of course, as you were saying earlier, the sweating itself mm -hmm. is effectively the reverse of the main concern of the potlatch, where you have people consuming blubber and <laughs> ladling fat over <laughs> each other. Uh, or ladling so, fat over fires and seeing if, they can, if you can still sit next to it. That's so. right. So the joke we came <laughs> up with was that to impress... To enhance his status and impress his ancestors, the noblemen of the northwest coast ladled candlefish oil into the fire at the tournament fields of the potlatch. The Californian chief burnt calories in the closed seclusion of his sweat lodge. So it seems like another inversion, this time in terms of bodily aesthetics, if you like. And do we have the real fake thing in there, or should I improvise that? One? That's coming next, oh, coming and that was you. You found that, yeah. so I'm going to hand over to you. Okay. Um, but the, oh, the other thing we noticed is that they, they seem to have been very aware of these reversals. There's this mm. fabulous article by Brightman about mm. the clown oh, yeah. uh, among the Maidu. And what clowns, the figure of the clown uh, does uh, is kind of laze around mm -hmm. and eat too much and behave <laughs> in a slightly megalomaniacal uh, fashion, mm -hmm. um, almost as if dramatizing yeah. uh, this kind of other uh, Not even almost as if. Uh, exactly <laughs> as if. And then you found out this point about fraud and illusion, right? Is that in there? Uh, that's this bit. Um, yeah, because... Um, where is it? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, if you look at ritual, it's, it's really striking uh, that 
there is this obsession of interiority in California and exteriority in, in the Northwest Coast. Of course, the Northwest Coast ha is most famous for having these masks and transformation masks within masks and um, the sort of theatricality. Uh, they're really into sort of props and stage effects and trap doors and fake blood and you know, all this theatrical illusions. And in fact, the word for ritual is illusion. I mean, it's the same word. Um, there's been a lot of debate about this, but uh, it could mean fraud or fake. You know? uh, but there's a kind of a play, a constant idea that, that the sacred involves a play of surfaces and false surfaces. And um, you, you're attaching on names in the same way as you attach on masks. So. Whereas in California, you know, so, so, so the word for ritual is, is fraud. Uh, whereas in, in California, it's all about reality. You know, it's all about finding the real reality, which is, is you know, the, discovering that the real world is an illusion. And, and it's through these exercises of carrying wooden water, steaming away yourself, uh, so forth and so on, that you, and, and, and doing these various mental exercises in forms of meditation. That, yeah. So it's very Protestant, um, and it's a way of yeah. a mystical Protestant almost. Um, so you know, you're finding the real, the, the, the real world. Is it an and you get an ontological difference? Almost. I'm not sure. yeah. Yes, we'll let us discuss this. Uh, um, but um, yeah, so, so, so it's reflected very much on an assumption about what you're basically doing when you engage in ritual. Mm. Um, one is, is really you are finding this interior self of the true, re true reality of a world which is not normally uh, a, a, a apparent to you. Whereas in the Kwak Yudal, it's, it's an endless play of surfaces. Yes. So it, right, and the, the Californian, the point of ritual in, mm -hmm. in the Californian case seems to be about finding what is authentic within mm. oneself. And there is a very striking account. I mean, obviously, both of these groups uh, from time to time adopted Europeans, and the Europeans uh, in the Northwest Coast uh, case were often given mm. honorific titles and so on. But a European who was unlucky enough to be adopted into a Californian society would find himself mm. hauling wood. Uh, yeah. down the slopes crying I mean the act oh, yes. of weeping to show how, how hard you're working and how painful the weeping work is weeping or sweating or yeah, so seems sweating off water them. seems very important and then they become one of the real people you become a real person yeah. <laughs> now um, and then you found this account by uh, Buckley who is uh, oh, yes. so this is a recent uh, a recent ethnography one of the very very few um, that's right um <laughs> Which uh, is interesting. I mean, if you hold in your mind the, you know, the, the kind of idea of Northwest Coast ritual as a kind of game of smoke and mirrors, mm. masking illusion and so on. In the and California, then, the, nowhere in California do they ever use masks. It's one of the. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> why, why didn't we say that? I don't know. Why didn't we? Oh, yeah, such an obvious point. <laughs> uh, well, it's too late. All right. Um, <laughs> Right that time. But if you, if you hold that in mind about the Northwest Coast, and then you listen to this guy, uh, Buckley, and he's talking here about um, um, uh, somebody called uh, Spot, Captain Spot. Captain Spot, yes. <laughs> um, in 1865. Uh, so this is one of these uh, Europeans who was, was taken he Iraq into... Was he or he was European and became Iraq? Yeah. He became Iraq. Um, as he accumulates himself and becomes more clean, the person in training to be a proper person uh, with his Yurok uh, relatives and peers mm. sees himself as more and more real, and thus the world as more and more beautiful, a real place in experience rather than just a setting for a story for intellectual knowledge. And then Buckley says, in 1865, Captain Spot trained for many weeks as he helped the medicine man prepare for the first salmon ceremony at the mouth of the Klamath River. The old medicine man sent him to bring down Sweathouse Wood. On the way, he cried with nearly every step because now he was seeing with his own eyes how it was done. Tears crying are of crucial importance in Yurok spiritual training as manifestations of personal yearning, sincerity, humility, and openness you discover your true vocation in a very Weberian Protestant right. uh, sense. It's about as opposite to a Kwakutl chief as you can possibly imagine. And in fact, he then goes on to say, when someone else's purpose in life is to interfere with you, and this is what Buckley's informants told him, 
He must be stopped, lest you become his slave, his pet. He thought, okay, that's about as clear as you could uh, yeah. <laughs> hope for. And maybe that's where we should finish, um, mm. having more or less convinced ourselves and just about convinced <laughs> three regional experts that there that is something, something going on here. Going yes. on here. <laughs> yeah. And obviously, you know, it's going to take decades more research. This is just really opening up questions. We don't claim by any means to have uh, reconstructed uh, exactly what uh, went on here. But, you know, as the archaeological evidence accumulates and you can begin to put it together with some of these ethnographic and historical sources, it seems at the very least to be a worthwhile question um, of, uh, you know, at what point does this divergence uh, occur? Are we talking about millennia? Are we talking about uh, centuries? Um, and then, I guess underneath that, the point that we ended up with is that the sheer diversity, I mean, the political dynamism and diversity of foraging societies has been so horribly underrated mm. uh, in general. Um, yeah, people really do see foragers as slaves to their environment to some degree. Or yeah. if they're not, they're just assumed to have some sort of default yeah. of raw yeah. egalitarian simplicity. It might be comp environmental factors might complicate it somewhat. Yeah. But they're not seen as people with who engage in politics in any meaningful sense of the term. And I think yeah. this is one of the key things we were trying to bring Definitely. back is that these are people conscious of self of different political, uh, social, sociological, organizational possibilities mm -hmm. in the same way that people in, were moving back and forth seasonally in many places between alternative social structures. So they were aware of social possibilities and, 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 and you know, uh, developing a set of values that rejected some and, and accepted others, often in contrast with their neighbors mm -hmm. uh, in a mutual process of schismogenesis. And this is, is how politics has worked through much of human history. And it, it, it doesn't start with agriculture and the rise of cities. So people have always been like that. That's right. So in the, at the end of this adventure, we learned almost nothing about the origins of farming, <laughs> uh, but we learned something about We have theories the, about uh, that too. <laughs> we have other theories about that, but we learned something about the uh, political possibilities uh, without farming. If you yeah. like. uh, we felt it was, you know, even though we didn't come up with something useful for original premise, it just seemed so important to point out that. Yeah, especially why since. Why has no one talked about this? Well, well, especially since, we, the, you know, yeah. these same groups are sometimes even <laughs> described as being, uh, you know, incipiently hierarchical <clears throat> or having sort of emergent hierarchies. I mean, presumably, if you're a hereditary slave, there's nothing incipient about this. <laughs> yes. Um, and. Um, but if other people have, you know, self-consciously formed an anti-slavery ideology, which is right. what seems to have happened here, that's very historically interesting. And, and, and the fact that no one's ever even pointed it out or considered it something worth discussing is, is right. itself, you know, rather startling. And that's all we wanted to say, really, yeah. isn't it? In, in the end, <laughs> I think. Okay, well, we'll leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for this very lively dialogue. Uh, obviously, we are witnessing uh, uh, the, uh, something in the making. Yes. Uh, <laughs> um, for a volume book for, someday. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and we, 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 me, me, meanwhile, until we have the a text or a, a larger article or a volume, uh, we start asking a few questions. Um, I think the uh, schismogenesis <laughs> argument is very uh, uh, cogent and, and uh, suggestive, um, but I was. I mean, it implies stability in a way. The mm -hmm. more the more you differentiate yourself from the neighbor, the more you tend to fix and uh, and uh, reify perhaps some features by contrast, and mm -hmm. so they, there's very little room for. Uh, uh, changes mm -hmm. in different, uh, uh, either in technology or in ethos or whatever. Um, uh, change may happen when people try to combine things. And I've, in fact, there is a very interesting little group, the the, the one which is up north, the uh, the Tolowa. <clears throat> uh, I remember reading forty years ago. Uh, 
an, an article by uh, Cora, uh, how you say in English? Du, Dubois in French is with Dubois, no, is it? Well, <laughs> Yes, Cora Dubois, you say? Yeah. Well, yes. Yeah. Of the total of so. mm -hmm. Yes, 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 okay. Um, and um, it's a very interesting article because it's, um, um, it, it's a very clear example that there are different spheres of circulation which mm. do not connect. Which has been, it's a point that was made. She, 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 I think she wrote this article uh, before the, uh, the war in the 30s. And uh, so they, they are, they are uh, prestige uh, goods that circulate in one's uh, uh, secret, and then there are other kinds of goods, and these people had slaves. And what is interesting in, in that sense is that slaves were. Uh, um, young people who behaved, well, they were behaving like young people, that is, misbehaving, mm -hmm. and so they would be fined. Yes. And so, since they had no uh, uh, prestige goods, uh, these fines were paid by people who had these goods. And so if they could not repay uh, these uh, fines, they would become slaves. Mm -hmm. And so here you have a combination of something which is very close to Protestant ethics, mm -hmm. <coughs> in the sense that um, uh, they, they, the, uh, the, the, the accumulation of, uh, of uh, prestige goods was important, but without raiding, without mm -hmm. uh, conflict, and at the same time, slaves, in fact, were uh, the, the byproduct of... Uh, Ill conduct in a way, mm -hmm. and it seems to me like uh, some kind of combination between the two uh, ethos, mm -hmm. one from the north and the one from the south. Absolutely, yes. That's, that's, <coughs> that there, are several, there are several societies in that shattered zone area where they do that, and and the Iraq do that too. As a matter of fact, mm -hmm. they have um, debt slaves. Mm -hmm. um, so, so and in certain ways, there are points where two systems actually overlap, whereby there is. Um, where the, the payment of fines for murder makes it difficult to win a war, but they also have an alternative arrangement where you can profit off it. So the two, they, yeah, they shift into each other and overlap and in that really complex area up there mm. is precisely where that's happening. Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you for that. Yeah. And wouldn't you say that precisely these, these people who try to combine different features mm. are in fact some, the movers, I mean, mm. the, the, the one who will, Tend to invent new forms of or new new uh, uh, solutions to uh, ethical, uh, uh, political, uh, well, social what? problems, and in fact are the, the, the transformers mm. by mm. contrast with people who stay mm. in, in a in a face to face uh, schismogenesis. Mm. That's a good question. I mean, the very fact that the Wogi story does come from that area shows that these things were being contested mm -hmm. in a way that they didn't have to be contested in other parts of California. Mm -hmm. That's right. And mm -hmm. actually, we, I mean, I think when we got to about the third draft of the written version mm -hmm. of this, we, we just had to keep reinforcing that we are not talking about the total Californian culture area as mm. classically conceived. It is specifically about these groups like the Tolowa and the Europe who are, Europe who are in that uh, interstitial situation. Kind of zone As you of say, it does seem to be incredibly creative. Yeah, I mean, one thing I've noticed about the, the, the zones of creativity, um, it, this happens in the literature that we have, it's um, there are these kind of it's particularly in these zones of a sort of chaotic transformation that um, also between settlers and indigenous people that a lot of uh, political creativity takes place. There is a whole debate, for example, about the um, origins of the American Constitution. To what uh, degree to this six nations of the Haudenosaunee actually, you know, it's called the influence debate, you know, influence uh, the Constitution. It's very interesting because both ethnographers of the Haudenosaunee and um, at least white ones and um, 
uh, historians of the Constitution hate this idea, actual indigenous people and, and also the American Congress think it's fine. Uh, but um, one of the things that nobody seems to, to remark on is the fact that most of these debates and arguments between and, and, and the sort of creation of, of the Haudenosaunee Constitution and the relation with settlers took place in a zone where people were completely overlapping because half you know, missionaries complained they couldn't preach in Seneca because half the people didn't know Seneca because they'd all been taken from other societies. And I looked into it, and half of the negotiators who first proposed the idea of forming, you know, they said, well, we have a federation. You guys should really do it, too, to the colonists. Um, one of them was actually named Chicolemi. He was actually French. Mm -hmm. um, he was, like, you know, uh, taken in war when he was 12 and when Seneca became a Seneca statesman. Um, so, so it's exactly in these zones where everybody's completely mixed up that the sort of political institution building really comes out of. Mm -hmm. yeah. You have a clear case of, of uh, schismogenesis up north, uh, but in the contrast between the northwest coast people and the people of the interior, precisely, mm -hmm. oh. the Dene also, right. uh, uh, with, with exchangers also, uh, uh, la, la geste das Dival is, is, is in fact uh, an, um, the, an interpretation in mythology of this contrast of schismogenesis. Ah, oh, well, we need to look at that. Perhaps <laughs> no. You could, you as, could, uh, oh, I you, hadn't thought you, of that. You could read that as, as a <laughs> process of schismogenesis. No, that is the inversion that, mm -hmm. uh, that Levi Strauss points out in, in, the, in the myth you know, land, yeah. from the, from the uh, coast and uh, which are the, mm -hmm. I think the Belakula, if I remember correctly. Okay and the Dene uh, on the other side of the mountain, in fact, is an, uh, is an actual and uh, uh, deliberate act of schismogenesis, in myth at least. Ha, it's mm. one of the clams in the mountain goat horns. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Great. That's, that's, that's a very good idea. We'll have to look into that. <laughs> yeah, and there's mini schismogenesis happening on all sorts of different levels and shifting around. Yeah. You know, you know there's the larger bro um, one, but like in that zone, there's probably five different types of schismogenesis going on in all sorts of creative ways. Yeah, and, and, and also, I mean, I guess that this would apply to the ecology as well, in the sense that all of these groups are familiar with farmers and farming populations, whether it's in the Great Basin or the American uh, Southwest. What is going on on those frontiers? Um, yeah. The, That's another book. <laughs> I, I was wondering also the, the question that you, the, your, your, your discussion of the behavioral ecologist uh, uh, mm. argument about the control of, of the, the, the result of processing uh, uh, fish and uh, what could be made uh, of it and the, the, um, the necessity of having some kind of military. Uh, uh, armed force in order to protect this. Uh, it, 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 it rings a bell here because uh, you, you, you're probably familiar with the uh, uh, anate uh, uh, mm. argument on the, in fact, the origin of inequality as being based not so much on uh, the, the shift to uh, agriculture, but in fact the, uh, the, the, the stockpiling or, or mm. uh, accumulation. Uh, whether it's obtained through agriculture or through foraging. And so I think the control of the stock mm. uh, becomes a, a central point precisely, uh, not necessarily interpreted in terms of very uh, uh, immediate ecological uh, uh, mm. uh, 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 analysis, mm. but becomes a central point uh, to understand this perhaps the the emergence of, of, of certain kind of control, social control, and the necessity yes. to protect the stock, etc. I can see that, but at the same time, I find it very hard to envisage how a situation of endemic raiding uh, between relatively small-scale foraging groups could ever have produced a farming economy, because you never have the kind of uh, stability that would lead to uh, you know, an incremental return on investments, uh, which is implied by, uh, by agriculture. Um, so I think uh, the point Testal makes that, that really mm. interested me was actually about, um, uh, well, it's another sort of schismogenetic possibility, which is something we're, we're working on. Um, 
Tesla made a fascinating observation in the 80s, which seems to have been completely ignored oh, in the Anglophone mm. uh, literature. And he seems to have worked quite a lot with archaeologists and was certainly familiar uh, with the evidence for um, head taking mm. and head uh, focused rituals mm. and skull portraits and such like in the early Neolithic societies of the, uh, the Middle East in the Fertile Crescent. And he pointed out that, uh, you know, these, uh, you're familiar with these uh, from Jericho and Chatalhuyuk and mm. so on, mm. these uh, heads which have been plastered and mm. painted and so on. And he said, well, surely, you know, this must have something to do with uh, taking heads and violence in some way. Um, Actually not. Which is uh, no. probably not the case, no. but it's simply not something that archaeologists and prehistorians had really thought about very much. Um, you can tell if somebody's head has been cut off. You can tell, <laughs> and actually what might be interesting to look at is uh, whether the evidence for that kind of violence um, is uh, present among contemporary foraging societies, um, which uh, increasingly I think uh, might be the case. Uh, so that once again you could have rituals which are really about the care of the head, mm. um, juxtaposed to something which is uh, go back to tape type style yes. head chopping behavior. It's just a theory that that we're sort of playing with uh, at the moment. Is the uh, well, we should mention that that the the one of the theories of the origins of agriculture that we did come up with, and it's a little bit silly to come up with a theory of the origins of agriculture because agriculture has so many different origins and mm. has been, you know, um, since it really isn't a discovery, uh, foragers know perfectly well how plants grow, uh, that, so, so you can't tell one story, but the story that seems to be most cogent in, in the Near East um, is, it seems that it was, you know, it's almost the reverse of the Rousseauian story. Rather than agriculture leading to social differentiation, private property, class structures, um, you have something like a stratified society already emerging with Mesolithic foragers, particularly fisher uh, folk. Um, and, and the people in Gobekli Tepe also seem to be these kind of predatory raiding societies. Um, and it's quite possible that the agriculturalists are just sort of running away from that sort of thing into marginal territories and, mm. and, and making do of new techniques to be able to do so. And in the first agricultural side, seem distinctly more egalitarian, especially the role of women, which is very, very prominent. Mm. Uh, they seem much gender egalitarian. Um, and and um, one of the most cogent signs of this uh, that you can actually see is their attitude toward heads. Uh, uh, as mm. you were about to say. Mm. <laughs> this is work in progress. Yes, this is work yeah. in progress, but why not? Yeah. Um, yeah, it just seemed like there's a lot of severed heads and human sacrifice going on to go back Le Tepe, these giant uh, monuments created by foragers, and Chateau Hiyuk around the same time. They're carefully nurturing the heads of their ancestors. But what, uh, what <laughs> Testau uh, yeah. seems to have uh, done is make the prehistorians confront uh, mm -hmm. this uh, increasingly compelling evidence for uh, extremely violent uh, raiding and slaveholding way back uh, into prehistory, mm. with mm. examples uh, mainly from Europe, where the the evidence is. Uh, is it all Mesolithic, or does it go back further? Um, well, I mean, it goes back as far as you want to look, but the um, the the scale of it in um, later prehistory in Europe is really quite striking. Mm. Mass burials, uh, yeah. particularly in, in Germany. Um, and uh, I think uh, there's a lot of thinking to be done about generally the role of slavery, mm. um, which was something not much talked about because uh, it seemed too hypothetical, but the evidence now is so compelling in terms of body mutilation, mass burials, uh, and evidence of warfare. Um, yeah, evidence of warfare, where, for example, all the males seem to be killed and all the women vanished. Yes, you have, you, you have Neolithic uh, mass burials in Europe where the young women are missing and you have isotopic uh, chemical studies on human remains that show the movement of women from inland to coastal areas. Now you could interpret that in any number of ways but I think the point is that the, the archaeological science is actually getting good enough and detailed enough now that you can at least begin uh, hypothesizing about these kind of uh, processes in a way that just wasn't possible before except by analogy with uh, hmm. ethnographic uh, cases.
I think Testar was onto that. Mm. Mm. Yes, I think so. Well, we, especially in, also in his in his last books, because he's, he's left uh, numerous notes, and uh, they, they, mm. they, in fact, there's, there's already been two uh, po posthumous oh. uh, uh, yeah. books uh, published. Uh, really? One very recently. And almost nothing of his work has been translated into English. No, no, no. It's a, it's yeah. it's 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 a shame. It's terrible. Uh, it's, uh, there's uh, the. The, the thing, the, the, the article about the uh, the origin of inequality in in, in stock uh, in uh, stocking food mm. has been uh, published in English. But it's That's right. One yeah. of very few uh, right, pieces yeah. that have There's been translated into English. Mm. I'm sure there are questions. I have many questions also, but mm -hmm. still, yes, Madame, Madame, <laughs> uh, Madame Taylor. <laughs> <laughs>